Well, today we get very close to the end of our series, The Journey with Jesus. We have spent a year going through the book of Luke and looking at what we can learn and know and grow in in our relationship with Jesus by just taking a year and studying the three years of his ministry and how it was recorded through this gospel. And we're on the last night of Jesus' life here on earth before before the resurrection. And if you remember last week, we kind of talked, we talked about how it was a disappointing night for Jesus. All the time he'd spent with the disciples, teaching them and growing them, and then they just let him down one after the other. But there's a very specific story of someone who let him down that the Gospels do a little bit job, better job of recording the whole story. And I want to focus on that today. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke 22, 54 through 71. And then on Good Friday service, we'll be obviously t- talking about uh, Jesus' journey to the cross. Um, and then on Sunday, uh, Easter Sunday, we'll be talking about the resurrection. But we're going to focus on Luke 22, 54 through 71. And then we're also going to do some reading out of John today. And the, today's message is entitled, The Journey Begins and Ends with Jesus. The journey begins and ends with Jesus. So let's pray and we'll jump in. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you love us enough that you sent your son to come and live among us, that Jesus, you chose to come down off your throne and spend time in human form and and have to deal with all of the mess and the sin in this life (coughs) and live among it just so you could die for us. And God, I just pray that we would take that truth And we would remember that you did it because you love us. You did it because you want to be in relationship with us. You did it because you know we're not perfect. You know we fail. You know we're not worthy. And yet you still want to be in relationship with us. I pray that you open our eyes and open our hearts this morning. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, so last week we talked about this big proclamation that Peter made. If you remember, one of the points was how Peter made this huge proclamation of his allegiance to Jesus, how he would follow Jesus even if everyone else left him. He would not leave him. <clears throat> and I, I said that we would talk more about when Peter actually does deny him. So let's pick up there. We're going to pick up today where when Jesus is been arrested, and he is standing trial at the high priest's house. And Matthew also tells us that when he's standing trial at the high priest's house, that he's in front of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is present. And the Sanhedrin functioned as the judicial system for the Jews. So basically, Jesus is standing trial now on on his claim that he is the Messiah. And the Jews are holding him, holding court on it. And The Bible tells us that while the rest, everyone scattered, it does tell us that Peter actually, while he didn't go with him, he followed behind. He kind of, he kept an eye on where Jesus was going. He followed. And then when Jesus got brought in to the high priest's house, it says that Peter joined some others around the campfire, around the fire that they had to warm people in the, the outer courtyard. So let's pick up there. In verse 54, it says, Peter followed at, was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, this man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, woman, I don't know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you are also one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, 
certainly this man was also with them, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately, when he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned, and he looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to them, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. So I want to talk about Peter's denial. I want to kind of walk through this. And what this would have looked like, maybe. <clears throat> I'd like to put have, have each of us kind of put ourselves in Peter's shoes today, if we can. You know, I imagine when when he denied the first time, when that girl looked at him, and, and or probably a woman, um, when she looked at him and said, you're one of them. I imagine it stung a little when he, when he said, no, I'm not. Right? It, it stung. It had to sting a little bit. I mean, Jesus is his Lord. He's, and he's his best friend. And, and oh man, I just, I just didn't stand by him. I didn't stand up to him. I, I, I denied him. And it had to sting. He started to get this sinking feeling. But have you ever been in a situation like that? Have you ever been in a situation where you really didn't think about how you were going to respond or how you were going to stand to something or, or what you were going to say when someone called you on something and, and, and you, didn't, you didn't stand as you should have stood? You didn't tell the truth? You didn't own up or whatever it was? You ever, have you ever done that, uh, made, made that kind of mistake? I know I have many times in my life. And then you get that sinking feeling. <clears throat> and I've got to imagine Peter's kind of got that sinking feeling. But then the second time comes. Someone else says, you must be him. And this time, maybe he's actually even a little bit more indignant in his answer. You know, he, he, he's been wrestling with this, and, and now he's got a choice, right? He's got to choose. Once you've told a lie... Right? Now you gotta choose. Do I completely drop my pride? Do I, do I just confess and look like a fool? Or do I, do I become more indignant about my lie? And so Peter continues with the lie and it becomes more indignant. I don't know about you, but you know, I've, I've done that before too, where I've lied about something and then I feel stuck. Now I feel stuck. Now I feel like, well, you know, if I, I, if I confess, then, then I'm going ha- to have to eat crow. I'm going to have to, you know, people are going to lose trust, whatever, whatever it is, you know. And, but, but you just kind of keep buying into that. And you kill your soul a little bit more at a time. And then that third time came. And Peter denies him again. He he lies and he denies his God. He denies his friend. He denies the one that has stood by him through everything. And at that moment, in verse 60, it says actually like as he was still getting the words out, he hears that rooster crow. And he looks to Jesus, and Jesus turns and looks him in the eyes. I just want you to imagine how that felt. I just want you to imagine the shame he's feeling at that moment. To know the one who has lifted me up, the one who has served me, the one who, he doesn't even fully understand what Jesus is going to do for him, but even who Jesus has been for him to this point, the one who has had my back, who has saved me, who has done multiple things for me in in that way, he needs me, and I turned my back on him. And not only did I turn my back on him, I did it right in front of him. They saw it. That had to feel horrible. He had to be filled with such 
shame. Have you ever promised Jesus that you would stop doing something and then gone right back to it? Have you ever promised Jesus you would quit something and then you just pick it right back up? Or promised Jesus you would do something and then you didn't follow through and you didn't do it? I don't know about you, but when I do that, I, I, I feel shame. I feel guilt. Well, try to imagine you literally are staring in his eyes when you don't do it, when you don't follow through. <clears throat> That's where Peter was right there. That's how Peter felt. Well, from there, it says he woes out and he weeps bitterly. And then basically Jesus has been... He's been tried by the Sanhedrin, and now he's just kind of in waiting for the next morning before he can go before the Roman court. And during that time, he's basically beaten. Um, verse 63 through 65 describes a little bit of that, that they, that they would blind, they blindfolded him and would beat him and, and mockingly say, prophesy, who hit you? Matthew and um, John, John describe it even in greater detail where they, they were hitting him with sticks. They were spitting on his face. They, they wove the crown of thorns and they, they shoved it into his skull, just mocking him. Going through all that right after he watches Peter betray him. And then the next day, they ended up bringing Jesus before the elders and uh, and the people gather for the council. And they basically asked G Jesus flat out, are you, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? And Jesus says, if I were to tell you, you wouldn't believe. He handles these things so well. But, but then he goes on in verse 30, 69, he says this. He says, but from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So he's basically saying, I'm not going to answer you, but I am going to go back and be on my throne, right? Um, so then they, they all say, verse 70, they say, are you the Son of God then? And he says to them, you say that I am, right? So he, he literally just keeps kind of making a mockery of the mock trial, right? I mean, he's, this is a mock trial. He knows it, and, and he's just... Kind of saying, I'm not going to play your game. If the, let's, let's do this if we're going to do it, right? And he goes before Pilate. Well, I want to pick up now in chapter 24. Chapter 24, verse 1 through 12. Jesus has gone before Pilate, and he's gone to the cross. He's died on the cross. He was buried in the tomb, and now it's the Sunday morning after. And two women disciples, they, they are going to the tomb to, to prepare the body. And um, they, the body was in the rush. It wasn't buried the way they would normally bury it. So they're, they're coming to prepare it and, and give, put spices and balm and, and things to, to um, just kind of prepare the uh, physical body. And when they come, what, what happens? Most of us know the story. They show up and the stone is rolled away. The tomb is empty. And Luke records that there were actually two angels that they, they encountered. Now, here's something interesting. I'm just going to kind of bounce off the story for a minute. If you read, and I would encourage you to do this this week, read all four accounts of all, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of the resurrection. And when you read the resurrection in all four accounts, you're, you're going to notice discrepancies. The, the, Luke's the only one that says two angels. Most of them say one. There's different parts that are uh, just kind of different. And I've heard people say, oh, see, the Bible, that's just contradictions. It's all contradictions. The Bible has so many contradictions. See, I am so happy that those details are different. I'm so happy because if those were all exactly the same, that would prove to me that it wasn't true. Because you see, when you're making up a good lie, what do you do? You make sure you get your story straight, right? But when you're just excited and you're on, I mean, you got to imagine these guys, they're all running on amazing amounts of adrenaline when this is happening, 
right? The, the, something is miraculous. It's the most miraculous thing ever has just happened before them. And so they come and they run in and they share the details. You ever have four kids come in at the same time and try to tell you a story? And that's just about Jimmy skin and his knee, right? I mean, and, and they're, they're just, and the details are all messed up. When you have four, when you have four accounts of the same story, especially with that many details, people are going to not exactly get every detail right. So see, I praise God for that, for the fact that four people who are willing to die for this story didn't have every detail exactly to the same point. But instead, they, they, they told it as they saw it. So they go, and the angel tells them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? And he tells them to go and tell the disciples that Jesus is going, going ahead of them and that they should go find him. Now, something interesting is here that is in, only recorded in Mark. But in Mark, he records the angel saying, tell the disciples and tell Peter. He says, tell the disciples and tell Peter. Now, I don't know. This is, this is just my interpretation. But when, when I read that and tell Peter, for me, that's Jesus' way of letting Peter know. Make sure Peter knows I still love him. Make sure Peter knows I haven't given up on him. I mean, you got to imagine how Peter felt. I mean, they all felt bad. But Peter was the one who made this allegiance. No, no matter what everyone else does, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand by you. And then he literally looks Jesus in the eye and denies him. you got, it, you, you got to imagine the shame and the guilt he's feeling, the remorse. And, and I really believe this is Jesus' way of making sure the angel says to make sure that Peter knows that Jesus still has a purpose for him, that Jesus still wants to be in fellowship with him. A way of, for Peter to know that Jesus' grace and mercy on him is still there, that he is still loved. See, I don't know about you, but I remember times in my deepest sins of having times when I was convinced that Jesus didn't want anything to do with me. Some of you might be here feeling that way right now. That, man, with this sin I've got in my life, Jesus does not want to be in a relationship with me. Jesus does not want me. But Jesus wants each and every one of us. And see, I remember in those times when, when shame just feels like it owns you. And I remember sin in my life where I just felt like, I can't even talk to God right now. If I were to pray to God, he wouldn't want to hear it. And you see, that is simply the enemy trying to win through the power of shame. But Jesus always has the message of restoration. Jesus is always saying, no, don't listen to that. I want you. I want to be in a relationship with you. I want you to walk with me. I don't want you to live in that shame and in that guilt. So they go and they tell the disciples and they tell Peter. And in verse 12, it says, but Peter, they all went, they all went to the tomb, but Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen clothes by themselves and he went home marveling at what had happened. Peter was ashamed. He was remorseful, but he wanted so badly to be restored, to be back into fellowship with Jesus. Now to finish our story, I want us to turn to John. We're going to look at John chapter 21. Because John records Peter's restoration better than anyone else. 
And in John chapter 21, we see that it's been a few days since the resurrection. Jesus has had some appearings, but, but nothing has really happened. And the disciples are just kind of in this waiting period. And they're like, well, what are we supposed to be doing? And so Peter, maybe in his shame, maybe just out of, I don't know what else I'm supposed to do. Peter's kind of an action guy. He doesn't ever seem like he's good at sitting around and waiting. Peter says, I'm going fishing because that's what Peter did. Remember, he was a fisherman. And, and so Peter says, I'm going fishing. And they all, the few of them say, let's, let's go. And they go with him. And they fish through the night and they don't catch anything. But I, w- I want you to see Peter's discouragement right now. I, I, you know, he denies Jesus and then he goes through this period of discouragement. You know, he's, he, he, he even, even in running to the tomb, you know, I got to imagine that he marveled, but he probably, there was a part of him that wished that he would see Jesus so he could actually be face to face with him there, you know. But we see this, this constant discouragement that he, he's had. But they're out fishing. They don't catch anything. Finally, they see a man on the beach. And the man asks if they've caught anything. And they say, no, they haven't. And the man tells them, well, throw your nets in on the other side. Now, every one of them at that point had to be going, this seems familiar. Right? And they throw their net in, and they haul in a huge load of fish. And as soon as they haul that load in, John turns to Peter in verse 7, and he says to Peter, it is the Lord. And listen to this. And Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, and he put on his outer garment, for he had stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. I love this. I love this picture of Peter. This, this picture of like, I know I've sinned. I know I fall short. I know I don't deserve it. But I also know how great Jesus' love is. And he just wants to get to Jesus. And man, I cannot encourage you enough. When you are feeling that shame, when you're feeling that sin, man, don't let the enemy keep you away. Do everything. Do whatever it takes to just get straight to Jesus. Don't let what other people are going to think, what other people are going to say, how it's going to look, how it's going to affect anything, keep you from getting to Jesus because that's the only place that the real restoration is found. It's not found in saying, well, I'm going to slowly be better. I'm going to get better at this or I'm going to, I'm going to be nicer. Or I'm going to, I'm going to try to be a better person. I'm going to go to church more often. That's not how it works. Just get to Jesus and let him Sort it out with you. I mean, here's Peter, a grown man, just diving into the water to see Jesus. Got to imagine the conflict in his heart. He had this desire to be in fellowship, but he's also filled with this remorse, right? I mean, this is gonna, he's got to feel like this is going to be hard, but but that's all, I don't know what else to do. This is all I want. He knew there was no way of overcoming the feelings he had without going to Jesus. See, when you're, when you're feeling guilty, you have two choices. Guilt is fine. It's okay to feel guilt. Do you know that? I know our world tells us don't feel guilty for anything. Don't listen to the world. That's a lie. Feel guilty. You, we, sh- we should feel guilty. Why? Because we're guilty. That's why. It's pretty simple. But you can do two things with guilt. When you're you're guilty, you can choose to live in the shame and say, I'm just going to, I'm going to hold this shame and I'm going to, I'm going to just live in that. And by the way, the pride that tries to keep us from admitting guilt is because of shame. The pride that keeps us saying, we don't, I, you know, I'm not wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. That's a shame feeling. You're just protecting it. But you can live in it and you can let the enemy t- use that to shame you or to build a wall around you so that you're bad, so that no one can have a real authentic relationship with you. You can do whatever you want with it. You can do that. That's a choice. Or you can give it to Jesus. You can give it to him. And he will turn that guilt into conviction. And see, conviction leads to action. Conviction leads to change. 
But it's your choice. Every single time we feel that guilt, it's our choice what we're going to do with it. So Peter swims to Jesus. <clears throat> the rest of them follow on the boat. They get to shore. And Jesus, they, they all see it's him. And Jesus says, come and have breakfast. Verses 12, this is on verse 12. Come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Now, that might sound weird, but think about this for a second. You and I, we, we you know, if you've read this story many times, you know this, right? It's like, okay, yeah, he, they're having that lunch with Jesus or breakfast with Jesus. Jesus just rose from the dead. Right? I mean, this is, this is still mind boggling to them. They, no matter how much we, it might seem like it would be obvious, this has still got to be, they've, they've got to be questioning it. There's no way this is just like, hey, Jesus, I, I totally, I knew you were going to be here. Right? That's not the way it worked. They're, so, they're, so they know it's him, but their, their minds still can't really wrap themselves around it. Right? But verse 13 Jesus came and took the bread and he gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to disciples after he was raised from the dead. Verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, tend my sheep. He said to them the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. This is Peter's restoration. This is his restoration. Think about this. As Jesus is asking these three questions. Peter, do you love me? I get, first time, I imagine when Jesus asked him the first time, do you love me? Peter was very quick. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Have you ever known you've done something wrong and you just want to be quick to get it over with and, and get back to things, right? I, I know some of my kids more than others. They don't, want to, they don't want to talk about it. They just want to at all just like, yes, I know I blew it. Let's, now let's just move on, right? Like, I just want to feel better now. But, but, we, but until we actually have grief over our sin, we don't really change, do we? See, until we know how much of a grieve, grieving thing sin is, we don't change. Remember, Peter made this lofty statement of allegiance, saying, I would never leave you. And then he, and then he denies him three times. Jesus knows, Peter, you, you need... You need to really get this. You need to really get that I still love you, that I have a plan for you, that I forgive you. So he asked him again. I got to imagine that second time. Peter probably took a deep breath and he was a little more thoughtful on it. And he goes, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Probably stung a little bit more. But that third time, he was truly grieved. Now, I want you to just picture the mirror of this that this is. Where are they sitting? Around a fire. Where did Peter deny Jesus? Around the fire. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. How many times does Jesus try to make sure that Peter knows he's restored? Three times. The whole picture had to just be in his head. But I think the key here is grief. That Peter was finally, he was grieved. See, he just wanted the restoration. He wanted 
to not feel that way anymore. But sometimes we just need to grieve our sin. Sometimes we need to grieve that we have caused damage. In order for us to truly find healing, to truly find restoration. See, we live in this culture that says there is no sin. And then we wonder why we're all so mentally messed up in our culture today. Because we're all trying to just pretend everything's always okay and no matter what you do, it's okay. No, it's not. We cause hurt, we cause damage and until we reconcile with that and realize and are willing to to get it out in the open and talk it through and and go for confession and and really repent, we are going to continue down a road of depression, anxiety, and stress, and anger, and all these things that are taking over our culture. Because none of us are doing anything wrong. It's always just something else's fault. But here's what I need you to know. When you're discouraged, when you're down, when you're distracted, when you're seeking the approval of others, Jesus is asking, do you love me? Do you love me? And sometimes he wants you to grieve those things that you've let get in the way so that you can truly be restored. Jesus ends all this. I won't read the whole thing, but in verse 18 and 19, but basically kind of a prophecy of letting Peter know that let, kind of saying, well, I'm glad you love me. I'm glad you're going to follow me. Here's how it's all going to end. You're going to be crucified. This is kind of a prophecy of Peter's crucifixion. We have a lot of historical evidence showing that Peter was crucified in his death. See, Peter, Jesus is saying, do you, do you love me? Do you really love me? Because just so you know, it, it's not always going to be rosy for you. It's not all going to work out for you. But I've got a purpose for you. And I'll restore you and you'll be in fellowship with me. And he ends the whole thing. This is what is is really cool for me. He ends the whole thing after he says all that. What does he say? He says, follow me. Follow me. See, we can't do anything that Jesus calls us to do if we're not following him. That is the journey. The journey is just following him wherever he leads. And I have to imagine, like I said, this whole thing has like been a mirror for Peter. Denying Jesus around the fire, being restored around the fire. Jesus telling them to throw the net on the other side of the boat and and went just like he did the first time he, he really revealed to them who he was. And now, as far as we know, his last interaction with Peter, he ends that with, follow me. See, the journey, no matter who we are, it begins and it ends with following him. Jesus is asking each and every one of us, do you love me? And then the ultimate request is, then follow me. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you call each and every one of us to follow you, that you love us enough, that you want to restore every one of us into relationship with you, that you don't want anything to separate us from you. But God, we, in order for that to happen, we have to recognize that our sin does separate us. We have to grieve our sin. And we have to hand it to you so that you can bring restoration in our lives. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.